This morning, we are here to celebrate and support the 2019 recipients of the McKnight Fellowship Award. These are granted on an annual basis and provide recipients with a generous grant to support their continued work in the ceramic field, the opportunity to present about their history, work, and techniques, additional support to further support their professional development, and feature placement in an exhibition that starts at NCC before it travels to numerous sites across the state of Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. The McKnight Foundation has supported this fellowship opportunity through NCC for Minnesota Makers since 1997. So a really great supporter for us, and frankly a lot of artists in the state of Minnesota. So we very much appreciate McKnight. This award, along with the residency supported by the McKnight Foundation, enrich the lives and careers of the recipients and the communities here at NCC and of the ceramic makers across the state through lectures, workshops, exhibitions, and the conversations that take place through everyone, everyone's participation and interaction. I would like to thank the McKnight Foundation for supporting these programs, for the artists that they support, and for the incredible impact it has on them. For today, we are going to be starting out with an artist talk by Guillermo Guardia, and then one by Kelly Knoll um, before our break. Guillermo Guardia received his BFA in Industrial Design from Universidad Católica. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and both his MFA in ceramics and MS in industrial technology from the University of North, both University of North Dakota and Grand Forks, North Dakota. Originally from Peru, Guardia currently lives and works in St. Paul, Minnesota. He creates figurative sculptures and functional body pottery, integrating pattern form, which are influenced by art history, his upbringing in Peru, Catholicism, his transition to living in the United States, and political events. Guardia has exhibited nationally and was awarded a fellowship. Council on the Arts and a residency at the North Dakota Museum of Art. His work is featured in the permanent collection of North Dakota Museum of Art and Grand Forks, North Dakota, and say that one more time. Uh, Where you went to school? Uh, Universidad Católica. No. No. Puntos Encuentro? Yes. In oh, Col Colombia. Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, are you ready to go there? I think right. I am. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, about 45 minutes to talk. Hopefully I don't tire you guys. Um, I want to thank the uh, Magnai Foundation for the, for the award and the Nordic Play Center for all the support. Um, I want to tell you about uh, why I make what I make. And to tell you that, I want to show you where I come from. I am from Peru. Um, this is what Peru looks like. This is the Andes in Peru. Uh, the geography in Peru is very diverse, like the population too. Um, I think most of you have heard about Machu Picchu and the Incas. Uh, but before the Incas were many other cultures or civilizations that flourished in Peru and all South America and Central America and North America before it was uh, colonized. Um, this is also a photo from Peru. This is the coast of Peru. Most of the coast in Peru is like a desert, very dry. Uh, there are rivers coming down from the Andes that end in the uh, Pacific Ocean. So where those rivers uh, pass through the coast, they form valleys, and those valleys become cities. Um, this is Lima, where I come, oh, before that, uh, this is, these are Alaska lines. Uh, they were made about a thousand years ago. Uh, they are, when you are on the ground, on ground level, you can see them. You have to be on the air flying or a balloon, and you can see uh, those huge drawings, some of them are as, as thick as uh, a football field. Uh, some of them represent animals, uh, uh, whales, spiders, monkeys. Uh, some of them are mostly geometric designs, um, but you only can see them if you are in the sky, in the, in the air. So obviously, NASA people didn't know how to fly. So uh, historians wonder why and how they made it. So what was what was the purpose? Um, some of them think it was uh, yeah, like a calendar for harvesting. And also there's a theory that they were made by aliens. 
um, recently when historians or, or not historians, but the people don't understand what, why this Asian civilization makes something, it has to be made by somebody else, by extraterrestrial beings. Ancient people couldn't make this without help. Uh, but that's a theory. This is Lima. Uh, I was born and raised in Lima. Lima is a beautiful city. It's about 10 million people. Um, like any big city, you find traffic, noise, can be a little, you have to be careful where you walk. But it's a beautiful town. Um, but to tell you, also to tell you why I make the things I do, what I make, it's not to, it's also about where I, where I grew up, but when. Um, when I was growing up in Peru, um, when I was a little kid and also in, when I was a teenager in the 80s and 90s, uh, we have a very, a terrible, uh, violence crisis. Uh, there were two terrorist groups that they want to uh, overcome the government. Um, so they were uh, putting bombs in embassies, killing policemen, uh, ministers. Uh, every every New Year, every uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, just a few minutes before the uh, midnight, there will be a bomb and there will be a blackout in the whole city. So that's, those are kind of the memories that I had when I was growing up for those festivities. Um, that was a, uh, during the 80s and 90s. Peru right now is a, it's a, a very peaceful place. Um, it's very safe to go. I went there last Christmas uh, with my girlfriend and we had a great time. It's, it's a very good, it's a very peaceful, safe place to go. Um, but also during that time, the same time uh, period, um, we had a huge economic crisis, hyperinflation. Um, I don't think you will never experience something like this here in the States. Um, one day you go, you went to buy a piece of bread for, let's say, one dollar. The next day will be two dollars. The next day, three dollars, four dollars, and so on. Um, fortunately, uh, my family, my, both of my parents, they had good jobs. Um, they, they, they worked during the crisis. We had pretty much everything that we needed. Uh, but it wasn't the case for most people in Peru. Uh, so during that time in the 80s and 90s, many Peruvians migrated to other countries, uh, Chile, Argentina, um, the USA, uh, France, Spain, even Japan. Um, and those are, I don't like to blame people, but uh, these are the two presidents of Peru when, that, when I was growing up, and they were very corrupted. Uh, so I did. I have, uh, I dislike politicians. Uh, I dislike them all. Anyway, <laughs> I don't trust them. Um, so the one on the left is uh, Alan Garcia. He was president in 1985 to 1990. And then the one in the middle who, uh, the Asian, he's, he was born in Peru, but his parents were Japanese. He's Alberto Fujimori. He was president of Peru uh, from 2000 to 2000, no, from 1990 to 2000. But uh, the last year of his second term were extremely corrupted. He had to, he had to pretty much run away to Japan. Uh, and he quit his presidency. This is kind of hilarious but embarrassing too. He quit his presidency in Japan via fax to the Congress in Peru. Wow. Yes. And no, wow. only in Peru. And then he claimed that he was Japanese to stay in Japan as a citizen of Japan. So he could, we could, uh, the Peruvian government could uh, extradite him. Um, so he stayed there for a little while, for a, half, a few years. And uh, I think there was so much international pressure to the government of Japan that Fujimori had to leave Japan and he went to Chile. Uh, and he thought that the justice in Chile wouldn't touch him, but actually the Chilean government sent him to Peru to be on trial. And now he's in prison. And who knows, you know, doesn't guarantee you that he would pay for all the things that he did, but 
at least he's in prison. And Alan Garcia, he was president in the 80s, and then he was president again of Peru in mid-2000. So it's kind of unbelievable that he was re-elected president uh, almost 15 years later. Um, anyway, I don't like politicians. I don't like, uh, I kind of, I, I follow the news, the political news, but I don't like politicians in general from any, any uh, party. Uh, also, I want to tell you what kind of are my artistic influences. Um, I, I admire the art made in the Renaissance. I, I, um, I love the sculpture from the Renaissance. I love Michelangelo. I, I wanted to make a sculpture like him. So, um, I went to, uh, after, after high school, I went to university in Peru, Universidad Católica to study arts. But also before that, when we got, when we are in Peru, when we go to school in Peru, middle school, high school, even in college, we study, part of the curriculum is to study the culture that developed in Peru before the Spaniards came. And there are many of them in different time of history in Peru. And one of them who I like or I have study and follow, and every time I have a chance, I, I want, I go to museum to, to see their pottery is the Mochica culture. So we learn about these cultures in Peru, um, during school, part of our identity, our, our, our cultural heritage. Um, I want to call, I want to, um, I went, I went to, to college in Peru. I wanted to be, I wanted to study uh, sculpture. I studied sculpture for two years, art foundation for two years, and then um, um, I decided to switch majors because art, living of art is not easy. So I wanted to, uh, you know, graduate and find a job like anybody else. Um, but my last elective in Peru for my BFA was ceramics. And that's the only problem, I, I mean, if it is a problem with ceramics and clay, is that after you try it, you get hooked. And after I did my first elective in clay, I wanted to do more and learn more. And back then, there wasn't a, 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 a graduate program for ceramics in Peru. So I knew I, want, I need to go, to go out of Peru, get out of Peru and study ceramics or get a job. Um, something I forgot to tell you, um, I am Peruvian, but my mom is Peruvian too. My dad is Peruvian. Uh, my mom's dad, my grandpa from him, on my mom's side, he is Japanese. He was born in Japan and he immigrated to Peru when he was five years old. He grew up in Peru. He met my grandma. They had kids. As I mentioned, eventually I was born. So I am part Japanese. So during that time in 2001, 2002, after I graduated from college, I thought, okay, I need to study ceramics. And if I can, can't get into a program for ceramics, I need to work. And if I have to, if I want to get a, enough income to work, I need to get out of the country too. And I thought of leaving, uh, leaving Peru to go to Japan and work in Japan like many of my cousins and many of my uh, uncles did in the 90s. And if I was going to Japan, I was going to work as labor, you know, making TVs, factories, stuff like that. Uh, but I was uh, fortunate that I was accepted in a couple of uh, universities and colleges in the States. Um, and I decided to go to the University of North Dakota. And people always ask me why. <laughs> yeah, they all ask me, uh, yeah, you are from Peru. Why did you come to the States? They ask me, why did you go to North Dakota? <laughs> and, and I tell him, you know, I didn't know too much. And <laughs> I wanted to get out of the country. And University of, University of North Dakota gave me tuition waiver. They have a, I was surprised that they have a, a program for diversity. And they have some money there to promote other um, uh, students coming from abroad to countries to, the, to, the, to North Dakota. To to promote uh, diversity. So I got tuition waiver, and then after a year, 
or maybe, yeah, after a year, I got the GPA. So I didn't pay tuition and I also got paid. And I, it was a great experience for me. The university has great facilities. I made very good friends. It was my first time out of Peru. Um, I loved it. I don't know. Every time I told people I was in North Dakota, they are surprised, but it was a great experience for me. It worked out for me. Um, during that time, it was the first time I personally experienced with raccoon. And I think most of you <coughs> are familiar with the firing technique. You know, you make your clay object, you put in the, you fire it, you get about 1800, 1900 degrees, you wear up. Uh, protection for for the heat, and you pick it up with a uh, metal detector and put it in a container to do the reduction fire. So you will see uh, I saw smoke and fire coming out of my sculpture, and I think most likely I believe it because, because I was raised Catholic. Uh, I don't practice anymore. I I kind of dislike church, so I am I, I call myself a bad Catholic. But I still have the guilt. I feel guilty <laughs> of everything I do, even though it's nothing wrong. Um, so when I saw the flames and fire, I said that should relate the process or the image. I, uh, I it reminded me of hell. You know those things that you learn in church that okay, if you do this or do, don't do that, you're going to, to go to hell. And I thought that should relate the process to the uh, piece I was firing, and I started making uh, demons very realistic demons, devils, um, a skinny body, long horns, skinny legs, uh, like the one on the right. Uh, but they, some of them made it through the fire, but some of them broke too, because the thermic chop was too much for the clay to stand, and they were break, uh, had cracks, and I, I, I didn't want that to happen, and I thought, okay, I need to find a way to keep working with this firing and keep the idea of the demons, and but changing the form. So I wanted to keep working with the human body. For, um, and there are two forms in the human body that kind of are round. They are round that they could stand to the fire. It was uh, working with the image or the form of the babies or overweight people. And I decided to go with the baby. And I started working in the baby levels. Um, Basically, the baby devils, and this is also coming from being raised Catholic. Uh, babies are supposed are supposed to be pure. They don't have sins. They don't have the original sin yet. But this one has the little horn, so they combine the good and evil. And on the um, to, to start with, they represent that one, uh, the good and evil in the Bible. Um, when I was in college in North Dakota, um, it was, it was I, I don't know, it, it kind of uh, I lived the, no, the college experience of, you know, I did my work in the studio, I do my homework, everything, but uh, you sometimes go on, you, are, you go out. You know, and so I started making a series of baby demos that they went out on a weekend. Um, <laughs> The third one on the left, on the lower corner left, is a baby devil uh, smoking. But he's not smoking cigarette, he's smoking a joint. The second one, the one on the lower right corner, he, he has been drinking too much. He's holding a bottle of beer or wine, he's almost ready to pass out. And the one on the uh, upper right, he, he just uh, he just passed out. <laughs> <laughs> he just drank too much, and he smoked too much, and I called that one Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then during that my very first years in uh, University of North, University of North Dakota, the war in Iraq started 2003, I think, right? Or 2000. 2002, 2003. Anyway, um, I, I thought I should make artwork related to war, and particularly in that, for that particular war. And I started making, uh, keeping, working in the idea, uh, 
the figure of the baby devil, but I painted them with, uh, like if they were, uh, what a military camouflage. So they look like soldiers. And I make a, I think I make for an installation like six or seven of them, different color, different camouflage, different weapons. <coughs> and I was fortunate that the Museum of Art in North Dakota asked me to participate in an exhibition in 2009 about artists and war, and I uh, installed them uh, as an installation. They were, uh, um, they were installed like they were playing hide and seek, but instead of you know, finding each other as a game, as a game, they were finding each other to try to kill each other. When you made this series, did you have the space in mind, or was it just something you, you For the, thought of and during the installation, how you could position them in some ways? The first two, I made them like, I knew they were interacting okay. in a in a indoor space, mm -hmm. or actually in any space, because I can put it in any, like, in, a, in the corner or behind a wall. Um, but after I was invited to the exhibition, I was making them with that effect, with a with that expression in mind. Because all of them are interacting with each other. Yeah. Um, it was very intentional. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to make, I, I don't like bases for my, for my sculptures. Mm -hmm. I think if I put a base in my piece, it kind of frozen the piece to that geometric base. Mm -hmm. If my piece can stand up at itself, it belongs to the space. Or to any space it would. It can be a pencil, it can be on the floor, it can be on a table. It belongs to the space. Or inter interact with the space. And then for the same exhibition, I thought I should show the other part of war and violence. And it was about the civilians. So these ones are not wearing military, military camouflage. But that was um, making pure babies being uh, wounded. One is being tortured on the left, on the upper left corner. The next one is he is stood on a mine and her legs blew out. The second one, the one on the lower left corner, she has been raped and she's pregnant. And the other one on the right corner is uh, he was holding a grenade. And exploded, and then the other, the big one on the right, is my representation of the politician. So he wearing the Peruvian colors because I don't want to defend any other country than mine by personal experience. So he holding, uh, he's making a speech, and you know the story of Pinocchio. He's telling, uh, he's calling a speech, but he's full of lies, and. I, it doesn't show in the photo, but in his um, left hand, he called it man, showing corruption. Uh, and I call that baby uh, Alan Damian in reference to the Peruvian president of the 1980s. Um, I work in series. Uh, the baby there was one of the series I, I have been working for a few years now. Uh, but they are evolving and changing. Um, in 2011, I stopped painting them with Peruvian, uh, with the military, military camouflage, and I started painting them with Peruvian designs. I thought um, I wanted to show some of the where I come from, some of my heritage, and I started painting them with uh, the Mochica designs. They are very, uh, they use geometric forms, and some of, and they use, uh, also they depict uh, animals mm -hmm. and insects um, in the pottery. So they used to, when they made the pottery almost a thousand <coughs> years ago, they depicted in the pots everything they did in life, like hunting, harvesting, fishing, the, their religious, they, uh, they depicted their gods and goddess, um, and I'm just borrowing some of those designs into my sculptures. <laughs> I 
these are some examples of those baby devils. Um, so some of the baby devils I have made. This one still keep the, they are still keeping the idea of the duality and violence and the good and evil. But this one they are holding either one or two swords, and they are samurai swords, and that's not a random choice. I, ch I am using the samurai sword as a reference to my Japanese heritage or my other side of the family heritage. So in this one that they're holding the sword, um, I'm showing my two cultural heritage, the Peruvian and the Japanese. And mostly, uh, mostly, I think all of the new babies I am making, all of them are female. And uh, I mean, it's not that clear here, but if you look, you know, in, in the genitalian area, you will see the gender. You recognize the gender. Um, these are two of the baby devils that I started. Um, I want to make clear that I am not making these babies because I have an affinity for guns. Uh, so to make it that clear, I started using, um, I started putting uh, flowers on the bullets. So even if I shoot, they won't kill anybody. <laughs> because uh, some of the collectors that have been, they have been buying my artwork, they kind of fall, they like guns. And I, I don't really like that. They buy my artwork because they like the gun, because the gun. So I started making those flowers and putting the bullets. Um, at the same time, I was working or starting the idea of the baby devils. I also started working with the series of the puzzle pieces, uh, 2002, 2003, when I was in North Dakota. It was the first time, like I said before, it was the first time I was out of Peru in a new, in a, the first time I was in another country. Uh, my English, my English is okay right now, but back then, it wasn't good, good at all. So every time I was going to classes or trying to talk to people, I, I, it was a big credit. I couldn't, I, I just was nodding, you know, when you don't understand something, you just nod or say, yeah, 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 I, do, I did that. So it was a very confusing time for me. Um, and some days I just went home and had a big headache. It was the whole day thinking and trying to understand English. And it's very difficult to learn a, a language from, let's say, English, learning like English in Peru, than coming to the US, an English speaking country. And speaking English and trying to understand the same as you are saying Spanish or any other language. Um, so I was very confused. I was homesick. I didn't know where to take my art, what direction to take my artwork. I knew I wanted to work with the human body. Um, one of my um, artists I admire is Rodin, Agustin Rodin, and the thinker. So I started making a thinker, uh, the one on the left. But um, I didn't like it how I didn't like how it looked when I finished the the, the cock in the clay, and I was so frustrated that uh, I was very close to break to smash it and put it back in a bucket. And I started drawing lines, and those lines were crossing each other, and those lines became pieces, and eventually I started making look like uh, puzzle pieces, like those pieces that the pieces that make us what we are, or the pieces that we're missing in life. And sometimes I feel I don't know, I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. So it's like a feeling of anxiety. Um, so essentially those puzzle pieces represent who, uh, what we are, how we fit to our time, to our space, or how we fit in a community. Working an idea of or the series of the puzzle pieces mostly in torsos. And then I think also it's a different series, and this is a series about immigration. Um, 
I sometimes my work actually my work can be very whimsical and friendly and kind of cartoonish, but even though they're kind of whimsical, they have a I want to say I want to think they have a meaning behind it. So when I was in North Dakota, I went to visit my friend Jesse's farm on the west part of the state of North Dakota, in the corner of North Dakota, uh, Montana, and South Dakota. And her dad has like a couple of hundred sheep. And in the middle of the sheep, he has a llama. And it, it was just so weird for me to see a llama in the plains. <laughs> and he told us that llamas are as good as dogs to protect the sheep against coyotes. Because if you have seen a llama, llamas are very feisty. Um, they see a coyote far away, and they go and chase them. They are fast enough to catch them, and if they do, they kick them, and they can even kill them. So uh, that was an amazing part of the story, why people have llamas here. Um, llamas back home are just, in the Andes, are just a common sight. They are very, I mean, we don't get excited when we see llamas. Uh, but here, people love lemon. And that was uh, a surprise <coughs> for me. But then, um, that, that get me thinking, you know, lemons are not native from the plains in North America or North America at all. They're native from the Andes in South America. So somebody brought them here for a purpose, as an animal farm, as a pet, or anything. They, they were here, they were brought here for a purpose. So, in that sense, llamas are immigrants. And that reminded me that I also came for a purpose. So when I am making llamas, I, I use llamas as a symbol of immigration, as an immigrant. Um, I use color to represent diversity. Uh, llamas are not blue, they are not green, they are not yellow, red. I use color to represent different nationalities. Uh, they look alike, but they are all different. They are made by hand, one by one. Um, I just wanted to keep the individuality of each piece, like people. You know, we, look, we look alike, but we are different. Um, more llamas, and this is how, the first ones are the llamas I made in North Dakota. They are more round and shabby, maybe. But these ones are more like, have more hair. They look a little different. And that, that I want to call that a fat coyote, because they are feeding on a sheep. Also part of the series of immigration, when I was in uh, Grand Forks. Grand Forks is in the border of, uh, uh, on the west, on the east part of North Dakota. It's just, uh, you cross the um, Red River, you are in East Grand Forks, in Minnesota. So there are two towns and two, two cities and two states separated by a river. And they are just, um, uh, they are close, there are a couple of bridges that, bridges that cross the river. So I thought it was going to be a good, uh, a good location to work on the idea of uh, crossing the border. So I started making these little clay figurines of this very simple like little kids. They were climbing the railing uh, in the pitch and they started running to the other end. Um, just uh, kind of representing them crossing the, the table, looking for something somewhere else, somewhere else to live. Um, and then I put some of those figurines on the grass, on the ground. Uh, by the river, and they looked like they were, they are right across the river, and they are yeah, running down. They are, uh, they are running into North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live there, so they, and they were going where I live. Um, in 2016, um, I was a little in shock uh, after the election. Um, so I didn't know what to, um, how to show what I was feeling in that particular moment in time and history. Um, 
And eventually I thought, you know, I live in North Dakota. I live in, I live in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, a red state. Most of my friends uh, voted for the current president. Um, and that's totally, I mean, that was her choice, totally respectable. Um, but I thought I should show, I started working on the idea of representing minorities in a red state. And if I was going to uh, show minorities in a red state, in North Dakota, I should start with myself. And so I started with a uh, self portrait, self portrait on the left. And then I started working uh, with a portrait of my friend uh, Todd on the middle and the portrait of my friend Sarah. And my portrait represents uh, immigrants, minority immigrants. And then my friend uh, Todd is gay, so gay uh, in North Dakota. And also my friend Sarah, who is a very independent person, a female, but very strong female person. But I didn't want them to show, I didn't want to show fear. I wanted to show them like, Powerful and fearless, like gods in Asian Greek or Roman or even uh, pre-Columbian gods. Uh, so there, look, uh, I if I would have more time, I would have made more other members of the community, minority members of the community. But then they moved here to uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, to Saint Paul. I do pottery too. Uh, this came almost as a chance, as a something that I like. A, I, I never thought of making poetry as a part of my hard work until some uh, some friends asked me to North Dakota to be part of an exhibition, just mostly mostly functional, all poetry. Uh, and I started. I knew how to throw, but I didn't think I was that good to sell my thoughts as functional only. So I wanted to relate my poetry to my, uh, also my artwork, my sculptures. And I started um, painting them with uh, the Peruvian design. And this is, a, this is a new series I started working when I moved here to the Twin Cities. Um, like I have told you, I am from Peru. I have been in the state for almost 17, 18 years now. Um, I, ho I go home, I go to Peru very often, once a year at least, or at least for Christmas. Uh, but every time I go back to Peru, it doesn't feel the same. You know, I recognize everywhere I go there, everything looks familiar, but the emotional connection is not there anymore. I have changed, I am aging, uh, my relatives are getting older too, uh, my, gra uh, my, my dad died three years ago, well, only four years now, so even when I go back home, I don't go to my parents' house, I go to my sister's apartment now, so Peru will always be home, but it doesn't feel the same. I thought North Dakota was, or Grand Forks was my second home, and then I move when I feel I had to go somewhere else to find new opportunities. Um, and I am here now in the Twin Cities, and the Twin Cities is still too new to me. I think to feel home is not just it's not just a physical location, it's how you relate to the people living in that space or city or community. And I, th I think if I want to be part of this, I want I need to make those connections. Uh, it's not much friendship is I have friends here, but to build that connection to the city, it's a it's a it's my way to make this space my home. I did it in Grand Forks, I had it in Peru, but I don't have it yet here in uh, in the Twin Cities, so it doesn't feel like home. I, I go this is where I live, but it doesn't feel like home. I want to be part of the community. I want to be part of at least the art community to, to feel like I belong to, belong to here, to the, to the city. So when I think of home, um, I think of uh, memories. Memories when I was growing up in Peru. When I was five, seven years old, 
my parents were strong and healthy. Um, I spent most of my days in my grandma's house with my brother and sister, with my cousins, and play all day. We all have good memories when we grow up. Um, so one way to bring those, to show those memories about home, my way to bring those memories is uh, making sculptures based on cartoons I watched as a little kid. And for now, I'm just choosing uh, Japanese cartoons I watched as a little kid. Um, so I started with uh, this one, it's called the original, uh, original cartoon, it's called Astro Boy, uh, but I call it Astro Mochica because it has part, the, the figure is based on the cartoon, but the designs on the surface are Mochica. The same designs I use for my baby devils. Um, this is called um, Ultra, it was called in, uh, Ultra 7, Ultra 7, but I call it Ultra Mochica. It used to be, it was those, those Japanese shows that this guy dresses on a costume and he becomes like a giant and he's fighting monsters. So, um, and I love to watch those things. And I think it was black and white. And then one day it became in color. Um, this is a Massinger GG. And it's also based on a Japanese cartoon from late 70s, early 80s. Um, it's a giant robot, and on top of the head, there's an aircraft, like it's uh, controlled by a, like a pilot, and the pilot controls the, the robot. Um, this is uh, based on a cartoon that I think most of you will recognize, uh, Speed Racer. Uh, in Spanish, was was called Meteori Meteoro, so I call this one Meteorito. One of the newest ones. It's another uh, attempt to work with the idea of Meteoro, Meteorito. And I went, I went home for Christmas. Um, and every time I go back home, I try to go to museums as much as possible. Or, well, our gallery is a museum, but mostly, or at least one. Uh, Peruvian pre Colombian museum. Um, and then we went to the uh, we started in, inside Peru. We went to the Andes. We visit local ruins in the Andes. Um, so it's, Peru is still like, uh, a point of inspiration for me, a motivation to regain energy and uh, find, look at ideas in a different way. Um, that's some of the pre colonial artifacts and the sculptures uh, we saw in Peru. The, uh, the one on the upper left is Nazca, the, the, the one in the middle is uh, Caracas, Chica, no, Chimu, Chica on the lower left, and Chica on the middle, lower center, and then the one on the uh, lower right are Shabin, Shabin the one. And I have been trying to, instead of on, not just using the designs on the surface, I am going to start using it as element of the sculpture, of the sculpture itself. Um, so they will become part of the, uh, the beam, like a new figure, like a new combination of two cultures, two Geographic uh, location from Japan and from Peru. Uh, this is how I make my dogs. This is my my family used to have a dog named Tenchi. Um, I know it's kind of cute and we love him, but I don't like to make things because they are just cute. They have to do something. Um, so my dogs are peeing and they are peeing on the AR-15. And I think most of you are familiar with that name. That's the uh, favorite gun for uh, mass shooting. So, I think that's all I have to say. And thank you for coming.
I'm just going to jump right in and frankly introduce Kelly. Again, while I'm talking, feel free to get beverages, get food, um, you know, get up and move around a bit if you want to. Um, but basically, I'll just give you a quick um, quick spiel on Kelly's background and what she's doing. She'll give her presentation. And then, again, there'll be a 30 minute break between Kelly's presentation and Kelly on um, the workshop. In the meantime, do you guys have any questions for the panel? We've got, we've got some time here. Um, I have a good question, well, actually. <laughs> um, what are you using to add the decorative elements on your pieces? I mean, they're, they, they're hand painted, but what are the, the materials? Well, you they are um, under glazes. Okay. Uh, and I use tiny, tiny, tiny fine brushes. Tiny. I know it's time consuming, but um, I. I spend more, more, more time painting than the copying the piece now. And it's not a complaint, I enjoy painting now more than doing the copy. Is there anything to decorate? I think that's how play is done, so we need to be done after it's fired. Well, I, I made the piece in play, let it dry, I pissed it, and then I start painting the design with underglazing it. I fire again, and then, uh, I do a lot of fine with a clear coat, with a clear beard to protect the surface. I, I, this is just me, I like to touch. Whatever I make, I like to touch when it's finished. So, I, when I finish my piece, I like just to touch it and I think I smooth surface kind uh, Protection of, for the feeling of touching, the feeling the surface. Do you have a specific way you smooth this surface? I know some people will sand their best work. Well, I try to use uh, a rubber. Uh, Rip? Yes. Rip and it works pretty well. And the clay I use is a mix of stoneware and porcelain. So it's very smooth at the end. Um, so that's it. Why is the size of the scale? Oh, the scale? Well, it can be practical reason for the king size and also the baby is the kind of like baby size to start with. So yeah. So and then I size. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just stick with that format. And everything's hand built, you're not using press bowls or no, any no, sort of wow. No, and that's uh that's something I might have to change. <laughs> <laughs> not because I don't like it, but I am I am not at all, but I am getting all there and I can feel it in my hands. Okay. So for physical reasons. Yes, because okay. I love working with foils or a cop team, but it gets my hands are getting tired. Yeah. And if I make more or something that I don't have to press all the time. It will be easier and I can make more pieces and uh, even painting. Uh, I'm not have to wait to make it easier on my hands. Well, any other questions for you? I have a couple of questions. Get it done. Oh, wow. Do you always keep fire? Low fire, high fire? Well, these are all the pieces that are mid fire, like cone, from cone four to cone six. Okay. I do a bisque. Uh, the first fire is a bisque of, of four. Uh -huh. uh, and then from that goes to con four or con six. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you Donna? How long have you been in Minnesota? Uh, since 2017. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I like it. I like it. doesn't feel like home yet. No. Mm -hmm. No. And I think it's connection. It's, I need to make the connection. Like, I love coming here to the play center. Because I think I have created on a, a connection with the with the building and the staff. So I feel welcome and I feel people like I can say hi to people, I recognize faces. I mean it's, it's an art community and I feel part of this art community. So that was my first step. I want to be part of the community. Um, to be part of the art community I started with the center. Oh man, it is a great community. But Guillermo also has done a number of workshops for us that are outside of the Night rounds. He does some educator workshops and other things. So you have really engaged in, in exactly. different ways in the education. And, and that thing also, with I think personal as an immigrant, 
to feel part of the community and you know I have received a lot from coming to the States, but I want to give back too. When I give back, I feel part of the community too. Does it make sense? Yeah. You know, like a family, you know, you know you only know how to eat and do your laundry. You do <laughs> 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 well, mothers appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you, girl. This is wonderful. Thank you. So, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce our next presenter. So, Kelly Knoll received her MFA from San Francisco State University and a BFA from the University of Montana in the Sula. Knoll combines the tactile nature of play with images of memories and emotions, addressing relationships with environments natural and constructive, human and man. Her artwork has been exhibited across the country, notably at the Enseca Biennial at the Kentucky Art Museum in Louisville, the Enseca Invitational at the Bellevue Arts Museum in Washington, and the Contemporary Crafts Museum in Portland, Florida. She has also been the recipient of numerous awards and honors for seeing a Jerome Ceramics Artist Project Grant, Minnesota State Arts Board Grant, and McKnight Residency. No currently resides in Northfield, Minnesota, where she is an associate professor at college. So, All right. So I'm gonna um, preface my comments by uh, full disclosure. Um, I had back surgery two and a half weeks ago, and <laughs> so this is my first foray into the world. Do you want to dress back? <laughs> no, I no, no, I think I'm okay. Um, so I'm not quite myself today, but I'm hoping that I can be a good enough version that I keep you interested for a little bit of um, the talk today, and then I'll show you what you can do. So, um, so my hope is to show you a little bit of sort of my process, how I think about my work, and uh, man, there are so many lovely overlaps with what Guillermo had to say about his process and, and why he makes what he makes. So um, hopefully you share in some of that sort of synergy that happens between the two of us. So I thought I would break things into uh, some common themes that I see in my work. Uh, one of the great benefits of doing something for 32 years is that you can uh, look back and see that, oh my gosh, these ideas that I had so long ago keep coming back into play. And I, I guess when I started in this world, I didn't believe that that would be the case. Um, but the older I get, the more that I realize those fundamental experiences that happened in really the first 15 years of my life have had such a profound impact on how I'm living out maybe the last half of my life. Um, so I come from a very rural place. I come from um, Montana. And um, I guess I would say I saw some of the very best things of Montana and some of the most brutal things <laughs> of what it means to live in a really rural setting. Um, so to me, that image, that's me at about 18 months old, and that is uh, perfection. That is, a, that is a perfect example of a Montana childhood. So I grew up in landscapes like this, and I thought that this is just what the world looked like. Um, I think as a kid, you just know what is around you, and so you, you until you go someplace else and can reflect black back on the places you come from, you just think everything um, is, is like where you're from. And so this, uh, this is just the landscape. I, I had a pony, and I, I'll show you some pictures of my pony. Um, but I spent all of my time uh, in, in, this landscape, in this landscape thinking about what it meant to be so unbelievably insignificant. And, and I think, again, that's something that is so absolutely important to how I think about my work now um, and you know, who I am as an artist. So the, um, I'm showing you the Bitterroot Valley, um, south of Missoula, if you've ever been to Montana, and that's the place I call home. <coughs> so moving, I, when I left Montana, I, I wanted so desperately to not be in that, that landscape and not be in that place. But I couldn't help but take the aesthetic sense that I got from being in that environment. I grew up with no TV, because there wasn't any TV channels that made it to our little part of Montana. And so uh, the natural world and my relationship with animals was really it, kind of everything. 
Um, so as I moved, I moved to San Francisco for seven years and then came to Minneapolis for seven years before going to Northfield. Um, really, the sensibility of looking for pattern, looking for um, what happens when something, when there's an explosion of color, what that does to my brain, and then what happens when there's an absence of color but a bit of color, how, how does that excite something inside me? Um, and that just has such a huge impact on how I think about making artwork. Um, I, I started out uh, thinking that I was going to be in the sciences. Um, I'm very much drawn to trying to understand the natural world the systems. And so um, biology and chemistry were the places where I just felt so, so, so much at home. I grew in Montana in small schools with combined grades. There was no art um, at all. So I, uh, as a kid, I loved to sew. I made costumes for all my animals. <laughs> I um, loved to make things, but never once did I hear the word art associated with anything that I did because that just wasn't part of part of our world. Um, so just again, thinking about my process, I often will find something in nature that I think is really interesting. So here's a seed pod that then I might make as a way of trying to understand that form a little bit more. So here's a porcelain version of that little seed pod. And if it is something that I'm that I'm interested in pursuing more, I might follow down kind of a rabbit hole of thinking about how does that form show up in different places um, in the natural world. So here's that that seed seed pod, uh, but also grains of sand and a white blood cell and uh, another sort of natural form. So okay, so like following sort of a bliss of thinking about how different forms in nature on a microscopic level and on a level that we can see with our eye. How do those things interact with each other? And, and those sorts of things, sort of this scattershot way of thinking about form, um, often end up in my work. So here's an example that he said is protecting one of those little porcelain prickly balls. I kind of think of them as dreams or spirits or something that. Uh, growing up how I did, I had a very clear sense of what animals were for food, what animals were for companions, and what animals were companions until they were food. <laughs> and that's really important because it, uh, I was constantly trying to assess like my, my place and my friendships within this larger context of the natural world. Um, big impact on how I make things. So for a number of years, I made work um, that was kind of, um, I love stories. I'll talk about storytelling in a minute. I won't tell you all the long stories. We'll be here for two days. But uh, but there, um, like this is an example of a, a time taking my pony into a, a fair, um, and she just betrayed me completely. We were supposed to go through this obstacle course, and then stop. instead she stopped and started eating the straw that we were supposed to be jumping over. And <laughs> kind of the whole arena of people had to get off and like pull my pony out, and people were laughing, 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 and just feeling that complete sense of betrayal and also sort of humility of uh, that interaction. So I, I love the stories, and I love thinking about how those stories play. play. Uh, so I can't come from a family of storytellers, and there are storytellers, especially my dad, who's like a loud slam and on the table telling a story. Uh, and boy, I love that nature of storytelling, but I found it totally intimidating. And I think when I went to college, thinking that I was going to, I was absolutely 100% destined to get it to a surgeon. Um, again, loved science and loved working with my hands, and so surgery, um, and I love the natural world and the human body, that surgery just seemed like the perfect place for me. I stumbled into an art class because I had to. I had to take three art classes as part of the liberal arts curriculum, and I took a drawing class because I thought, oh, that's a really neat thing I know something about, and then I took a photography class because I got a camera and I wanted to know how to use it. And then I thought, well, I'll take ceramic because I'm moving into an apartment and I want cups and bowls. Um, I cringe a little bit when I say that out loud because that's a terrible reason to take a ceramic class, but it's honestly why I did. Uh, and after maybe two days in my ceramics class, I thought, oh my God, this is the language that I understand. Like, this is how I can understand storytelling. Um, and I could go on 
forever talking about artists that had a profound impact on me. But Yola Fry, Richard Shaw, and Robert Arneson were the first three artists that when I saw their work and read what they wrote about their work, I, I honestly felt like they were speaking a language that just made sense to me, that they were telling stories in a way that had, um, on one level, were so accessible in that the imagery was recognizable imagery, uh, but then they also had these like, deep political and deep um, thoughts about social justice, about um, the way people treat each other. I mean, they're just amazing. And, and I think that um, as a young person looking so much for some sort of truth or some sort of understanding to make sense of that I told you about like the best parts of growing up in Montana there's lots of other parts that are not so lovely and trying to make sense of those things these three artists gave me some sort of language they gave me a way to to, to begin to think about how I might express myself um, as a teacher I can't help but show you the work of David Carota and Beth Lowe who were my um, primary instructors in undergraduate and graduate school. So my work has so little in common with their work, but my God, did they help me understand sort of what my voice was uh, and why why it's important uh, to study the history of, of clay, but also to, to kind of get good with yourself about why you're making what you're making. Um, my first teacher was Rudy Audio, who I... Just absolutely adore, um, but I feel like um, I met him at the very, very end of his teaching career, whereas Beth Lowe and David Kuroko were kind of in that, the thick of it. Beth was just starting out as a professor, and um, her work is, is it's been a, a joy to watch over 30 years how her work has changed. Um, again, lots of years, so I'm kind of taking some big jumps here, but uh, it, as a graduate student, I had unbelievable facility to make great big things and I felt like um, I moved to the Bay Area because the figurative tradition was so alive in the Bay Area and that's really where I thought I could hone my skill and also participate in the conversation. That was really exciting thinking about the rebirth of the figure. Um, I also wanted to try to reconcile the fact that I was teaching in an inner city school where all of the students in my class had had, had a very close experience with gun violence. And I came from a culture where everybody had guns. Um, my dad, I always think if their house ever burned down, it was, it was reported as, yeah, arsenal in his family because he had like 300 guns and like, I don't know, 20,000 pounds of ammunition. Um, and he's not even a, like a scary Montana person. <laughs> he's just kind of a normal Montana person. Uh, so I, I really, I, I wanted, I had a student in my class, Robert, who was shot on the way to school, and when he came to school after recuperating, he uh, talked a lot, I thought third grade, and he talked a lot about um, how guilty he felt that he had survived. And that, oh, that just had a huge impact on my soul in thinking about how, how this, in the early 90s, there was a lot of conversation around um, gun laws, kind of amazing, but so there have been a lot of conversations about gun kind of laws, uh, but at that time I, I was really trying to reconcile uh, my grandparents on the bottom, um, my grandfather was a skeet shooter, champion skeet shooter, uh, on the left, my stepfather went to Vietnam when he was 19 years old, got shot up, got sent back, got shot up, came back, and got shot up a third time, and then finally didn't go back. Um, there's my dad, and you know, there's a mask figure, a full head of a mask figure. So, so gun violence was uh, on my mind in a huge way. And I wanted to try to reconcile what was going on in the political spectrum and what I was kind of doing with in terms of. Uh, also, that whole thing of having lots of kilns and lots of equipment, I wanted to see how, how I could challenge the material. So these figures are all about people and um, It's hard to get an idea of that in slides. Um, but if I stood, let's say, by the um, soldier, I would come to just about his chest. Um, so they were made on the floor as, as great big flat pieces, um, made solid, cut up with a butcher knife, and then hollowed out from the back side, um, fired in pieces, and then assembled on the wall. Um, after um, 
after that, <laughs> I thought, oh man, I've got to, I've got to come back a little bit in scale and think about what that is. So I moved to Minnesota in 1997, fall of 1997, totally on a whim, uh, without a job, without really any direction. Um, but I had a couple of, of dear friends here uh, that I wanted to be close to, and also I knew I wanted to leave California. So for, after graduate school, I was teaching in um, San Francisco during the school year in LA in the summers, and I did that for three years, and thought it was so cool, <laughs> until I looked around and saw that people 10 years older than me were still doing that 50 life, and people 20 years older than me, and 30 years older than me, and I thought, Man, I want a garden. I want. I just want something different in my life. And so, um, came, came to Minnesota. And right after I arrived, I saw a posting for the Growing Foundation um, Growing Fellowship and applied and got it, which meant that I had to live here for a year. And so that I, I mentioned that specifically because uh, what Guillermo was saying that it rooted me in in Minnesota in a way that I didn't expect to be rooted. I thought that I was just going to be here for a real short time until the next thing. But that little tiny Jerome fellowship rooted me for a year and and that had a huge effect. I, I feel like the last 25 years of my life were impacted by that that little little moment. Uh, so there's an eight-foot grandma uh, and she's feeding flowers. So I planted a garden and rabbits came and devoured my garden um, here in Northeast Minneapolis. And then I came again and the rabbits came and devoured it. And so I was um, trying to reconcile sort of male energy and female energy um, simultaneously with fish tied to the backs of rabbits. And, um, quite early on, I, I knew that I was interested in artwork that was not something that sat on a pedestal, but something that you experience, that you that you walk inside of, that you experience. Um, with your whole body as opposed to just just looking at it. And I show these um, especially because I'm going to talk in a moment about something really I uh, identify myself very much as a teaching artist. I um, at the very beginning when I started making things in play, what drew me to the medium and to the interaction with other people was talking about ideas and so really quickly, I, I knew that if I was going to pursue this, I wanted to pursue it in terms of being a teacher. Um, when I got out of graduate school, I told myself, 10 years, I'll do everything I can to try to get a permanent teaching job for 10 years. And if that doesn't happen, I'm going to go to PM teaching. But I just didn't want to be uh, moving around all, all of my life. Um, and so this is a piece called the Overeducated Board that's about the chair of one of the departments I worked in. I worked in 12 colleges before I ended up at the job um, and there are great things and some not so great things <laughs> in that process but there's a piece about that. I also, um, Khalil who's uh, visiting us from New York and I talked a little bit yesterday about words. Um, I put all the titles of these pieces on the slide because words are um, absolutely important to me. I, I'm not a writer and I feel like I have kind of a conflicted relationship with text and with words. Uh, but I also really love them. And I feel like when I read something that's written by someone who actually knows how to use words beautifully, oh, it just like touches me so deeply inside. And I, 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 I strive to do that through a visual language, but man, do I appreciate folks who can do it through words. Um, so the titles are, are very important. are just some pieces along the way just to kind of set a, a background. So use of multiples, unbelievably important. So that flower piece where I made, I don't know, that was something like a thousand pansies that those fish were jumping out of. That was the first piece that really resonated with multiples. Um, a number of years ago I had the opportunity to make work for an exhibition um, looking at collections. So um, all of the teaching artists at Carleton, where I work, we looked at different collections on campus and made work in response to those collections, which was a wonderful excuse for me to go to the biology department and say, hey, can I come hang out with you guys? This is where I started my academic life, and I would love to spend some time. So uh, in looking at their collections, and then also um, spending an awful lot of time in the Science Museum collections of taxidermy, 
uh, I had a lot of opportunities to just think about specimens, um, especially specimens from the natural world. And so I've made a, a number of pieces that deal with, um, with multiple. Certainly some reference to lab rats and, and again, all sorts of stories that so people always ask, why did I start making rabbits? And, I, and I'll and i just give you a real quick version of that. So uh, I had rabbits as a pet when I was a kid. Um, and if you have a couple of rabbits and they get out, you suddenly have like a thousand rabbits. And I, uh, a chunk of my childhood was spent on an alfalfa farm. Um, and that is a perfect environment for lots and lots and lots of rabbits. Uh, so I'm familiar with them. They have all this, this sort of deep memory um, from childhood. I also um, grew up with my great grandfather was a, a butcher, a county butcher, and raised rabbits for, for meat. Uh, and so there's that kind of interesting connection again that what are animals that are companions and what are animals that are for food. Um, and I just love rabbits as a um, as a, a signifier of all sorts of things. So in folklore. Um, two of the figures that I use quite a lot, rabbits and crows, are tricksters. They're characters that play games. They're characters that uh, are sly and kind of devious. I love, I love that about them. Um, I love that you can take really anything and put ears on it, and it becomes a rabbit. Uh, and so I, I would ask you to just look for a moment at what real rabbits look like, um, because the things that I make are not really rabbits. They're very much human beings that are kind of in a, a skin or some sort of, they're passing as rabbits, but they're much more human than they are rabbits. I, at first I made rabbits that looked like rabbits, but I really wanted to understand that. Uh, if you're, like I said at all, the Golden Valley Humane Society has a small furry area. Uh, when I started making these rabbits, I would go and, and manhandle all of or human handle, I guess, all of the rabbits um, as a way to kind of understand, like, well, what's going on with their structure? What are their bodies like? And, the Humane Society loved it because there was a person coming that socialized. But I love um, what happens when you take something that's very approachable and cute, like a rabbit, but when you're surrounded by 50 of them or 100 of them, it becomes very unsettling. Um, so a lot of my work deals with the feeling of nature, um, being in nature, acknowledging that we are, in fact, nature, um, that this room is full of nature because we are we are nature. And I think that as humans, we like to separate ourselves from the natural world. And the older I get, the more I feel like, oh, those early experiences of nature help me think about how I want to, how I want to be in nature. Um, and so that unsettling feeling that you get when there's just too many of something around uh, is something I really enjoy. I also just love visually the form of animals and the way that that relates to the form. So two favorite animals on the left there, rabbits and crows. I also think it's fascinating what we do when we try to uh, humanize or animate animals and, and the, the fascination we have in taking um, animals and making them be human beings. So, um, a, Early um, 19th century, or excuse me, early 20th century artist, um, photographer Harry Fries is someone that I really appreciate um, a lot in the way that he does things that are again cute and sweet and totally unsettling, like absolutely wrong. Uh, <laughs> that little marriage scene that's going on in the bottom there is just um, deeply uh, disturbing. Uh, so a number of years ago, I guess already 12 years ago, I had um, my first sabbatical. After teaching for 14 years um, nonstop, I had uh, a chance to, to have time to just work in my studio. Um, my earliest, earliest childhood memory is when I was about five years old, and in my bedroom, look, in the little girl place, looking out of my bedroom window, and in the space between our house and the barn, there were at least a couple hundred rabbits, again, because rabbits get out and they do what they do, <laughs> and so there are so many rabbits. Um, and there was a full moon that was lighting up the, the area, and all these rabbits, and a flock of birds flew by. And, and to see the shadow of the birds on the rabbits from the moonlight uh, for just a moment, like that is just so deeply embedded in my brain. And I remember thinking, 
oh my god, that's so beautiful. And I can't tell anyone in my house about it because they think I'm crazy. Like they just thought I was crazy all the time. That I cared about how my spoon sounded when I was eating my cereal, and I cared about how my cereal tasted better in this bowl and then in that bowl. And I cared about how when I made a pom-pom thing for my pony, what that was going to look like and what it felt like. And I think that I just understand the world through tactile ways of being and also through visual language. That um, that was a, a very important moment in thinking about who I was going to be in the world and how I wanted to experience life. Um, so I had an opportunity to remake uh, uh, to make a version of that um, that moment. And in making these pieces, it became really obvious to me that the um, the lighting around them, that, that they stopped being individual objects that sit on a table or sit on a pedestal, and they became much more about um, the experience of walking around with these objects and having your shadow interact with their shadow um, and really sharing space with them as opposed to looking at them. I also, in making this work, decided to, to take away all color. So I had been really seduced by color for quite a long time and just came all back to just black and white. Black and white and gray were the only colors that I could use in this tiniest bit of color in the eye. But I wanted them to be much more about form and, and that sort of guttural feeling that um, this felt more raw and visceral and less about the, the magic of surface design and color. And I think a lot about manifestations of beauty. And it feels a little corny when I talk about it, but I um, tried to sound somewhat articulate in saying that. So 19 months ago, I was hit by a drunk driver. Uh, and it has been 19 months of trying to sort out, like, what matters? <laughs> um, so after the accident, I had surgery on my at first. I, lost use of my right arm and had that surgery on my arm to get it fixed and kind of got that fixed and then now have this back thing and just have surgery on my back and so I had had a lot of time in the last 19 months to really evaluate like well what what matters what is what is most important to me and, and I think what is most important to me is finding absolute beauty in materials in process in darkness um, that I think art is a way to illuminate darkness but also art is a way to savor darkness. And we don't do that so well in our culture, um, that we like to make people feel better. We, we like to, if someone is sad or someone is um, hurt, that we just want to make them better. And I understand that impulse so well, but I also think that there is something, there's something really beautiful and excruciating in, in just wrestling with darkness. Um, so. I love materials, and, and I just come back to every part of the clay process excites me in a way that I feel like I don't even have ownership of, that it's something that is so visceral to who I am as a person and has so much less to do with my intellectual mind and more to do with something that I don't have language to describe. Um, I, I'm not a wood fire artist at all, um, but I have... Uh, I teach in a place that has a big arboretum and all sorts of wood, and so we built a wood kiln 10 years ago or so, and um, all of my friends from graduate school said, Kelly, you fire a wood kiln? Like, you are so not a wood fire person, and I feel like, oh, it has everything to do with who I want to be in the world and what I want to do and how I want to have my students think about materials and possibilities, and I guess my why I can't sort out me as an artist and me as a teacher is I feel like I learn so much by trying to um, understand students and understand ideas and try to find ways to articulate what excites me and to appreciate what excites them. Um, and so I, I make lots of pots. Um, I probably make 2,000 pots a year or something and I never display them but I, mean, I just like them and I make them especially because of teaching um, but I feel like it's a really nice way to, to do a different exercise a different part of my brain um, that's, that's also really important to me
Uh, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to work in a foundry, um, which was just fantastic to, to be a complete novice at something. Um, and so I ended up casting some rabbits. There's a, a rabbit that's red version is wax. Um, but then a shell was made around the wax, burned out, and then metal poured in. I just love these images of the, the casting process. Doesn't that look like they're doing something so important and they're casting <laughs> bronze rabbits? It's <laughs> the most trivial thing in the world. Uh, so this foundry is outside of Seattle and they mostly work on things um, in thorough, uh, thorough space. So they make objects for the military and they make objects for Boeing. Uh, and they just let me come for about three months and make stuff with them. Um, and it, it was life changing. Uh, materials. When I got my job at Carlton, it was two-thirds ceramics, one-third metal smithing, and that was really great for me because I was trained so much as a classical ceramic artist that you just find the ceramic solution. You never use paint. You never use epoxy. You find the ceramic solution. And suddenly, I had to learn how to do something completely different. And I had done a little bit of metal stepping just in my coursework. Um, but it gave me license to say, no, I can also just find the material that makes sense for the idea. And that, that was huge for me. And I brought um, these plumb bobs are things that I brought with me if you want to look at them. So uh, just, again, for reference, the one in the middle on the right is the actual um, sweet gum pod. The one that is featured on the left is the porcelain version of that, and then the one that's on the right is uh, here from the cat. Uh, <laughs> so I, in in this sort of liberation of materials and thinking about the natural world, I mean, I think God, there's just potential in everything. There's potential in Caribou Wonder loves for there's potential in um, the materials right around me. And that, again, is something on my mind quite a lot as I'm thinking about what um, Color started working its way back into my work in these little bits about five years ago. I also am, am pretty delighted in thinking about how you can take an idea. So I was incredibly fortunate um, five years ago to get in with my visit for a Fellowship and second time which I'm endlessly thankful for. Um, this is some work that I made. Um, I'll show you in a second the work I made for the McKnight Show here at NCC. Uh, but some of the work has to travel, and so I made this smaller version of a piece that could travel to go to other places. Uh, but then thinking about how it looked in other places, let me think about how I could rework that piece, how um, Especially post car accident, I spent a lot of time thinking, well, how do I take these bits and pieces of things that I've made in the past and reorganize them and think about bringing new things in? Um, and I also got a, a version of this celestial map. In the last year, I've been trying to teach myself a little bit about printmaking, uh, which has been incredibly rewarding as well. I love taking something that's visual that has a huge impact on. on way of seeing the world and then trying to bring that into other spaces. Um, for the last 10 years or so I've been using crows that enter into museum spaces and do other sorts of things. There's a, a version of it called Murder with a Red Nest. Uh, nine years ago my wife and I had twins and those were the those little eggs. <laughs> those are lesser gold eggs um, about the size of a small ostriches and that crowd of crows um, protecting them. Around five years ago, I had uh, two big things happen. You can think a little bit about what caramel talked about and like going home is different when different. So my mom died very suddenly and it wasn't a huge surprise. She was in her 60s, which for a lot of folks in my family is sort of a respectable age to to make it too, and uh, but it was it definitely jars your life and it changes, changes your life. So she died in October, and then in February, a student of mine who I've been very very close with um, had a, a disorder called ehlers danlos syndrome, which is a, a, a genetic condition that affects the connective tissue in the body. And she had been my student at Carleton, and someone probably a golden just 
one of the most delightful young people I've ever known. And uh, she had surgery to stabilize her neck. So if you don't have connected tissue, you can't really hold up your head and your spine is completely compromised. So she was having surgery to stabilize her neck and the worst possible thing happened. She um, ended up having complications after the surgery and my oxygen for 32 minutes and when we revived her, she was brain dead. In the course of six excruciating days, uh, she died. And so to contrast the death of my mom and the death of a 23-year-old incredibly vibrant person um, gave me pause and gave me a chance to really think about how I wanted to mark those deaths and also think about, um, I don't like the language of like you work through something or you get over something because I don't think you do. <laughs> I think it changes who you are and, and that's that's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. So I started making porcelain butterflies as a way of of um, giving myself an excuse for every day to take 35 minutes or so to just reflect and pause. Um, and that's kind of hard to do in your life when you have work and kids and life. And I just say, no, nope, no, nope, now is my time. So every day I would make like 40 butterflies as a way of pausing. Um, and those ended up becoming part of the piece that I made um, the last time I had been with my fellowship um, called From Here to There. So one of the things that happened in making this piece is, um, uh, let me back up just a moment and say why a, a zebra. So if people who have EDS or aortinal syndrome um, refer to themselves as zebras. So in the medical field, um, doctors are often taught when you hear the sound of hooves, think uh, horses, not zebras. So when someone comes in and says, oh, I have <laughs> this terrible cough, you don't think they have some exotic disease, you think they probably have a common cold. Right, so it's, it, the answer is usually the most common thing. But then, what happens to the folks that actually have that really unusual thing? Right, that and so um, people with PDS is a very very unusual um, disorder. Refer to themselves as zebras, and so I wanted to make uh, Talia to kind of make her her life force dispersing. Um, so that's why there's a zebra, and the zebra is a life size zebra. So from um, nose to Hook, that hook is about nine feet. Um, so I wanted to make something that was joyous and beautiful, but also not just joyous and beautiful, but also profoundly sad uh, and and beautiful. I mean, I think there's so much beauty in in sadness. And after 25 years of trying to make things look lifelike, it was really interesting to try to make something look dead. I wanted the zebra to clearly be something that had been alive but no longer was. Uh, and so thinking of the fullness, you know, spending all this time thinking about the fullness of form and studying anatomy to understand how things fit together. But what happens when that life force is taken out and there's a, a collapse of, of the body? Um, I also, in making this piece, became, um, I, I tried fishing line and uh, like every kind of thread possible and trying to figure out what should these 3,500 butterflies hang from. Um, and in, in that research came to this blue fuzzy thread, and I brought an example of it if you're interested, uh, how this thread, when you have 3,500 3, um, versions of it hanging, how it creates an atmosphere of its own. And again, that, that felt like the, the thread became a whole other presence in the work and something so, so, so exciting. I'll show you just a couple of other quick series. Um, Guillermo and I had a chance to be in a show together uh, last year um, called Sin, the Seven Deadly Seeds, right? And I realized the work I'm making right now um, is riffing a little bit on this. So I also was raised a little bit Catholic. Um, my mom was a Catholic, became a Catholic, uh, and then when I was a young child became a Christian scientist. Uh, and so I had these two very, very different religions um, fighting for my soul, I guess. And uh, I, I have a very, as a queer person, I have a really conflicted relationship with the Catholic Church. I also think there's lots of things in the Catholic Church that I would guess anybody would have a pretty conflicted relationship with. But there also are things that are so unbelievably beautiful about it. And so when I was invited to be in the show, I wanted to try to interrogate a little bit um, an institution that is so um, full of 
contradiction having any sort of um, ability to say what is sinful and what is virtuous. So in this exhibition I made um, seven deadly sins but also seven corresponding virtues and had all of the figures together um, with no description as to which was lust and which was gluttony and which was humility and um, really thinking that in fact an embodiment of all of those sins and all of those virtues is what makes us human. Um, I know I'm, I'm all those things better. Uh, I also started using the image of a skull, um, and it's funny to me that I, in my spare time, I watch surgeries, I read books about anatomy, I study about the surgery. I mean, I, that, 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 but I don't ever bring that into my work until the last couple of years. I've had a, a big presence. So now I'm trying to figure out what am I doing? So I'm spending a lot of time, um, just a couple of weeks out of surgery, thinking a lot about my back and trying to feel my body, um, and thinking about how it generally is talking um, about how you realize suddenly like your hands are tired, <laughs> your body is tired, and and as artists, I think often we don't we don't really think about our physical body. We think about our physical body when it's when it's not working well, and when everything is working well, it's easy to just feel like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to be able to do this forever. Um, but I'm having a lot of opportunity to think a little bit more about what kind of work matters and, and how I'm going to do that. So um, when I was making these pieces for the Sin Show, uh, I started using gold leaf, especially working on, on um, Catholic iconography, but also... Um, becoming much more interested in celestial maps. And so these pieces to me, while they're really different, there there's a lot of interaction there and thinking about undercolor. So what happens when you put gold on top of red or on top of blue and what what does that do to um to have color sit on top of it? I I go crazy about things like those rabbits as they're um, around that celestial map. There's a white line that corresponds with the black line of the map perfectly as it goes around. So I, I think about all sorts of very formal qualities in my work as well as this other storytelling. Um, about a year ago, I had an opportunity to uh, work in a space that is getting me closer and closer to what I actually think I'm going to do for the rest of my work career. Uh, so I uh, was invited to be on a show in the Karma Building in Northeast Minneapolis, and, at, and there's a gallery space and some other spaces in that building. And as we were walking around, there was um, seven of us in the show. I just kept looking back to this um, elevator shaft and feeling like, oh, I want to I wanna be in that, in that space. It was all full of stuff uh, at the time. And, um, and the uh, owner of the building said, really? That, you know, you want to use that storage space? And I was like, absolutely. Uh, and so I was able to create this this artwork um, that is, uh, that's 28 feet of red thread, um, and I have a sample of it there, um, but it, it used that space, or transformed that space, and allowed you as a viewer to enter that space and become part of a natural phenomena going on in that room. Um, so the elevator shaft is, is no longer useful as an elevator. All of the, the lines have been cut, so it doesn't go up and down. But that cart, as you walked in um, on the left, that whole elevator shaft would shift. And so you felt unsettled. Uh, the objects were unsettled. Uh, the incredible challenge to make ceramic objects that can move around like that. You know, we, we, I don't really think about ceramics as something that should be able to rock around, um, but it was important that that it rocked around. When you walked through the space, you couldn't walk around them. But as you entered the space, just the wind that you created by walking in would make that 28 feet of fabric or of um, textile material shift ever so slightly. So there would be this magical sort of tingling sound that would happen um, where when the white rat. Uh, white butterflies would touch each other. I also wanted you to be part of a natural phenomena in that this herd of, or um, murder of crows was watching you as you were watching this experience. Are they metal? No, they're all clay. Yeah. 
it also was a pretty magical space that you could enter it from the ground level, but you could also look at it from the second floor. And so that was that was pretty wonderful too to think about how how to consider the space from these two very different vantage points. It also um, one of the things that drew me to the space in um, as we were looking in the building is that there was natural light coming in and so at different times of day uh, it, the, the shadows would change a lot so it was reflecting back so much to that rabbit piece um, 10 years ago or 12 years ago uh, as as light would change like the, the experience of being in the space would change and I love that as a way of marking time about how how the natural world So in, again, thinking about manifestations of beauty, I also think about that in terms of collaboration. So I've talked a little about being a teaching artist is really, really it for me. I also have such a great pleasure to work with two colleagues, um, and you see how I'm even more in folks that, that I feel like we share a sort of similar language, and especially as I think about this next phase of my artistic development in thinking about wanting to really reflect on footprint. Um, and sometimes I feel like it's kind of, it feels for me when you say like climate change is the only thing that matters. But I feel like it, 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 to me it is. I mean, everything matters. Social injustice matters. Uh, poverty matters. Racism matters. Everything matters. And at the end of the day, if we don't have a, planet that we can live on, nothing else matters. Uh, and and I don't really have language to just to really talk about that, except for to say I need to really think about how I engage with materials and, and how I find um, an unbelievable parallel between missing indigenous women and the way we treat this message. <laughs> but to me those are so linked together I just don't know how to I don't know how to not to have them in this conversation. Um, and so we started making pieces, um, these are field stations. So really quickly, uh, a choreographer at Carleton heard a story on NPR about farmers in India drinking pesticides and laying down and dying in their fields because they, there is no market for the crops that they grow. So she created a dance performance around that, that story and asked, I collaborate with her quite a lot on things because we are interested in a lot of the same sort of things. Um, so she asked if we would want to make uh, some, if I would want to make some artwork that would riff on that idea as well. And so I brought in my two friends um, and we made these series of field stations, one on birth, one on life, and one on death. So in birth, uh, on the left, you there are porcelain bowls with seeds. Those are all seeds collected from the prairie. Um, and you could sort seeds. It's a med meditative act when thinking about the potential of of seeds. Um, so here's some sort of sorting seeds. In life, the series two, uh, the all the materials um, are from the arbor uh, not all of them. Most of the materials are from the arboretums, the natural lands right by campus. Um, so the wood that is used um, is from from trees. Trees, and then this steel plate is covered with clay from the arboretum. So for a number of years, I've been using clay in the arboretum um, in my classes, but it's always been sort of an extra thing where I'm interested in, well, what happens if we make glaze out of that clay? What happens if we, if we harvest that clay? I, I think it's it's so important as a teacher to help students understand how ceramics has existed, how it existed for 25,000 years before the way that we interact with it now, when we buy clay from Use it. Uh, so that's always been an important part of my teaching, but for the first time that became an important part of my work. Um, and in this piece, there were spray bottles that you could spritz the earth. And one of the wonderful things about this clay is that it would immediately heal itself, and then as it would dry, it would break up again. And so that that really thinking about the material as a living, breathing sort of material um, and you interact with it. And then in the third site um, station in depth. There, Danny Stapop, if any of you know his work, he makes these wonderful mechanical creations. So he's responsible for this contraption. Um, and in that contraption, there's a little magnet system that you can take 
uh, unfired porcelain butterfly and put it on a conveyor belt. The conveyor belt pulls it through a trough of water and it begins to slake off. And most of them um, would dissolve and slake into the water and, and disappear. So I, I can in my own work thinking more about um, do I really need to ever fire anything again? You know, maybe maybe I make things and have them be a moment in time and then they go away. That, that I'm becoming much more interested in in a temporal quality of the work. Um, any of the butterflies that made it through this um, sort of uh, baptism in the, the tray of water, if they made it through, then they still met their demise by being deposited uh, into a, a pile of dirt again from the arboretum. So this work, uh, certainly in the collaborative work, you sacrifice some of your ideas. You, you grow in incredible ways by hearing ideas from other people. This has really kind of focused me a little bit in thinking about what what it is I want to make going forward. So for the last several years, I've spent a lot of time with um, this book from um, the 1920s, um, the Plymouth Report of Plays and Shales in Minnesota. I work with a geologist quite a lot in the natural lands at Carleton, the Arboretum, in thinking about different clay deposits. I'm fascinated that the clay that we have in Northfield, Minnesota, is dramatically different than the clay that's in Red Wing. So if any of you are interested in the history of Minnesota ceramics, you'll know that Red Wing um, has high fire clay. And that's because that, that part of Minnesota was not covered by the last glacial um, covering. So Northfield was covered by the last glacier 2,500 years ago, uh, but, but Red Wing was not. And so the deposit by Red Wing is much less contaminated and is high fire clay. That's why Red Wing Ceramics was out of there and grew to be a huge ceramic company. Um, and, and I love that the clay that we have right in Northfield is a low fire clay, and I have some samples out there. I don't know where this research will go. I don't know if I will end up becoming someone who just uses clay on the arboretum. I kind of suspect not, but I am so very fascinated in thinking about how um, I love using brawling porcelain. But really, do I have to get porcelain from England in order to make my ideas, or is that? Oh, God. Only the company that owns the mines is in England. That's that's even crazy. Well, I mean, originally garlic comes from from England, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I'll say is, do I need to use talc from Montana and from New York and <laughs> EPK from Florida and garlic from wherever it's from? That, that we we have at our disposal in the same way on Amazon, I can order anything I want, and it, it's like I'm at your store two days later. But I don't know that I need to do that in my clay world, right? I'm just trying to understand a little bit more of it, sort of where I am in the world and and what that looks like, and all of that, quite honestly, is a way to try to make sense of this land. So I've lived in Minnesota for 22 years. And I just now feel like I finally have said, like, oh, I live in Minnesota. <laughs> and it's really interesting because I think I, I, I just never have felt like, oh, this is my place. And when I, it finally dawned on me, um, I became a full professor a bit ago. And when I realized, like, this is kind of it. This is where I'm going to live. Then I get hit by a car and I realized, like, I better just really get with it and figure out like how do I make this place my home because this is where I'm going to live for the rest of my teaching life and and maybe even beyond that and so it has been really important to me to to like dig deeper into the prairie and dig deeper into the history of this place and try to make sense of it in a world that's moving so fast how do we slow it down and how, how do I somehow think of this place where I am as an asset as opposed to just the thing that happened. So there's lots of things that just happen, but how do I become intentional about living in this place? Um, and in doing that, I'm just going to real quickly share with you, um, I had become very interested in looking at the indigenous ceramics, the indigenous people's ceramics of this area. And I feel like I'm going to be very clumsy in talking about this because I'm at the beginning of my research. And I also don't want to speak for other people, but I, I, would feel like I was not doing justice to the importance of talking about this work by not at least beginning the conversation. 
Um, so there is a very rich ceramic history beginning about 2,500 years ago. Um, and the blanket term used is woodland culture, or woodland ceramics. Um, and there are some examples of the sorts of pots that were made in Minnesota and Iowa and Wisconsin um, starting about 2,500 years ago. And uh, I, forever, for 25 years, I've been showing students examples of pots from all over the world, the earliest pieces in Japan and pieces from, from ancient China and pieces from Peru and pieces, but I've never shown images of the indigenous ceramics made in this area. And I feel like that is something that I absolutely want to change in the way um, that I talk about, about ceramics. Um, and especially as we're using clay, so clay from our, so I've spent um, many, many hours in um, at the Rice County Historical Society that has a tremendous collection of these pottery shards. Um, we have thought a lot about the kind of mark making, what these objects were used for. The tradition of pottery making in Minnesota ends in the 1600s, and it begins to end in the 1600s, and by the 1800s, it's right now. Uh, and that's because once there was trade with fur trappers, um, especially French fur trappers, uh, brass kettles became um, available, and so there was no need to, to make ceramic objects. And you can imagine if you have a brass kettle that is lightweight and much more durable, a uh, very fragile ceramic object would not be terribly desirable. So um, again, I don't, I don't. I want to be really clear that I'm not at all trying to revive a tradition of making that was here once and is no longer, but I also, um, in trying to, to take knowledge that I've gathered over 30-some years and bring it to a very local place, I, I feel like that's where I'm really interested in. Um, go. Um, then lastly, I thought, I, because I... Um, I'm not going to be able to show you some of the building practice I thought I, would, I took some slides before my surgery, <laughs> so you can see kind of what I do. Um, so for the longest time, I didn't use any molds here, mold, and I'm here to give you permission to use molds. Uh, so I decided when I was started making uh, lots and lots of pros that boy, if I could just cut to the chase, it would be so much smarter. You know that that it became less about the object and more about the experience a bee with lots of those objects. And so I could either uh, spend hours and hours making each individual pro, or I could make a very general pro, make a mold of it. And so that at least I take, like if I save an hour on each one, that doesn't sound like much, but if you're making 300 of them, that's 300 hours of saved time. That, that's an amazing amount of time. So I press these molds, score and slip them together, end up with a kind of a robot, you know, a really uninteresting general shape um, that I can then, uh, there's a little bit of surface information that's already in the piece, but not really much. So here they are kind of as robots, and even these I've started to move their heads around quite a bit. Uh, but then I can spend my time actually cutting the heads off and, and changing the position and and making them more personal. So there's still so much hand work. I, I felt like maybe it was a matter of pride as well, that I, I wanted to prove that these were not made from mold, these were not cast. When I started making figurative work in graduate school, and people would say, oh, are you taking mold of a body? Part of the reason I made them really big is I wanted to say, well, no, <laughs> it's not made from a mold, it's not be tall, right? It can't be from a mold. Um, but I realized now, like, oh, that's just so silly. It, it makes sense to get to the part that is the most interesting as quickly as possible. So here you can see that they, um, even though they're made from a similar mold or the same mold, they, they can and, and honestly, it, the individual object is not really important. I want to say thank you so much to the McKnight Foundation. I mentioned Jerome early on. I would say McKnight has had such an impact on my life, and, and that is really to be really placing. So thank you. Carlton College has given me. Uh, a life I could have never dreamed of. So I grew up with no idea of um, the vastness of um, what an intellectual life could afford me, and I have been unbelievably um, 
honor to be a part of an intellectual community that um, celebrates all of the weird things I'm interested in. <laughs> you know, but I get to I get to go with a geologist who is as excited as I am to do play and. Uh, I get to teach a class on the history of Japanese ceramics and vessel making with an art historian, and got to travel all over Japan with someone who just helped me navigate a world that would have been so unbelievably good <laughs> on my own. Um, I think my incredible students, who every day help me think about um, how I want to be in the world and how I think that there is a generation of humans coming up who are going to undo, well, they're going to make all kinds of mistakes, and they're going to undo some of the horrendous things that I think my generation and some of the have done. And then I think this sweet little family, uh, who seeing the natural world through the eyes of my children has reminded me kind of why we do anything. <laughs> um, so my daughter, we were on a walk the other day, and we saw a dead... Um, squirrel that was mostly decayed. It was just sort of a shell with bones. And my son ran as far away from it as possible. And my daughter got a stick and started digging around in it. And I just thought, oh, I love this. <laughs> You're like me. <laughs> you want to understand how the body works and, and what the that. Um, and I think modern medicine, uh, I had no idea that. Two weeks ago, I got my spine open, and today we would be today. So thank you all for coming, and thanks for it. Some of them. Some of them, I just let go away. No. Yeah, but she's here. She's here. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I, I like the fact that you work with big, big objects and then go down to small and make Ah. And uh, that's because one day I do want to talk about it. And that's exciting to me. So I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how did you go from big to small? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's such a big question, Mana, because I think um, part of it is that I want to feel like I'm getting somewhere. You know, when I make big things, it takes so much time. You know, an idea might take months to, to realize and and I want some gratification. You know, I wanna I wanna feel like I'm doing something. And so making some small pieces along the way helps me feel gratified in that way. Um, the other side of that is especially as a teacher, I have such little bits of time in my studio and so Sometimes working on a great big idea, it's just not possible. But that I can do something that, like crows, for example, or butterflies, you know, I can be working on that when I'm being disrupted quite a lot because it's something that uh, doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, and so making small things that then add up to something larger is a way to work when you don't have the things that speed your time to just get locked in something. Um, I think that coming a parent, I became a parent at 42, which is late in life to be a parent. And I worried, for the longest time, I thought if I don't touch play every single day, then it'll be two days, then it'll be three days, then it'll be a month, and then I'll never touch it again. And when I had kids, uh, I think especially having twins, I realized I had to not touch play for a while. And then when I went back to it, <laughs> and I'm a better artist now because I think that I used to dilly dally in my studio, and I would, and now I am focused. When I have studio time, I am a laser. You know, it's it, and it's not to say that everything, all that time, is well spent. I still get lost, and I experiment, and I have lots of things that don't work out because I'm trying to learn new things. Um, but oh, I have concentration that I get. And that, so the small things and the big things sort of exercise both those things. Thank you. Yeah. Did you string all those lines for the installation? I did. Well, with a wonderful student, yeah. yeah. Um, Moira Smith and I. So it took us about 60 hours, both of us working nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? We just camped out here. <laughs>